Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for gathering us together. Thank you for your word that does not return void. Father, thank you that you saw the beginning and the end before either was in play. And that you know all things. That you are not shook. You are not fearful. You are strong as ever. And your plan has been implemented ever since the beginning. A plan filled with mercy. A plan with a... Uh, life that can be grasped here on earth by us. A plan of prosperity, of peace, of healing, of direction. A plan of the cross in which you chose to put in yourself, your own son, as the sacrifice so that so many of us uh, could reap the benefits of salvation through his blood. God, I pray that you would speak clearly to us today through your word even more so as you've already spoken so much. Thank you for the things that you shared with us and as, as we reflected on the cross today, God, and, and just the invitation, the invitation to be part of your kingdom, to sit at the feast with you, Father. Let us not make excuses. Let us be diligent. Let us be good Bereans, let us study out the things that you've shown us and apply them to our life. The world offers so many empty promises. This journey here on earth can be delightfully fun in so many ways, and God, you have created a, um, a spectacular place for us to live and to inhabit and to seize opportunities. And yet, Father, you teach us and tell us that they're just a poor reflection of what you have in store for us in heaven. Help us not to trade the now for the forever. Help us not to trade these things that are just a shadow of the things that you have prepared for those who join you at the great feast. Help us not to trade the shadow, Lord, for those great things. It's easy, God, to see that even in the shadow, because we haven't really tasted the heavenly things in the way that you have prepared them for us, it's easy, Lord, to get distracted by the world, to get distracted by the allure of this terrestrial planet and at all it has to offer. And yet, God, it, it does not compare to what you have planned. So let's not sell ourselves short, Lord. Give us the strength and the knowledge, the understanding, the drive, the boldness, the fearlessness, and the faith to do what's right. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We've been going through Acts, and I've been enjoying it for myself. Uh, it's been a good journey to look at Acts at a much deeper, slower pace. I've done a lot of uh, reading of the Bible in my lifetime, and uh, I've taken it at different ways. Uh, I remember a period where I... Go ahead. I hate to interrupt you. Does the church still support uh, First Step? It, it, yes. The church does support First Step. We haven't made it as an announcement every Sunday, but do you have something for them? Yesterday, and decided to make a stop in there and see how things are going. I don't know if this is the right time to say this. Anytime's the right time. <laughs> uh, this kind of introduced myself, and I mean, I've supported them through the years. I don't think it's a good cause, but uh, and asked them what they needed and everything. And <clears throat> what they don't need is green beans. <laughs> uh, and they don't need clothing, but uh, snacks seem to be the big thing. They've got, it's kind of hard to drag down how many people are actually there right now, but there's actually uh, seven kids and one infant that's actually uh, there every other week. But the individual snack packs, uh, chips and things like that, so they didn't go through the whole bag. Uh, and uh, drinks, of course, and whatever those drinks are, they're like you know, a silver pack that have a straw that you put. What are those things called? Capri 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 and everything. And, uh, Sugar water. It was just nice talking to them. And uh, the one thing that uh, they're in desperate need of, I thought it would be like pillows. Remember back, they always need pillows. They got plenty of those. Is uh, sports bras. <laughs> uh, I don't know. But, yeah, <laughs> so uh, anyway, it was a nice visit with um, Captain Ellis when we were down there. He just felt like it was uh, 
something mm. you brought up, I don't know if you bring it up uh, or not, but it's uh, certainly a good thought. Amen. So first step, for those that don't know, is a place for women. It could be men, but it's pretty much dedicated to women, uh, oftentimes coming from an abusive relationship or a tragic situation in which they are displaced from their home. Uh, many, many, many times they are with child or have children, and so it's a place for them to have their first step outside of an awkward or difficult situation of life and to get some intermediate care before they can find themselves settled in another place. And so as JB has reported, the house is full and it sounds like there's, did you say seven kids and one baby currently along with their mothers and other women uh, being cared for. So that means they got a full house right now. They're not always like that. Sometimes it's two or three. Uh, it sounds like they're, they're cranking it right now. So. Sounds like they need some things, specifically, if you want specific things. He said snacks, uh, cool stuff for kids, uh, you know, things after that order. Sports bras uh, and, um, and money. Hey, let's just face it, money is a good gift too. So if, if you don't know what to buy, money is a good place. If you don't know how to give to First Step, uh, you can make, if you're going to make a financial donation, you can make one here designated first step. We'll make sure it gets to them. If it's material goods, uh, we'll collect them. If you need to bring them here, I've dropped off stuff there many times and so many of you have too. You just load it all up in there and go to get, go to get it. They don't highly public, publicize their location. It, it is publicized if you do a good Google search, but they don't highly publicize their location because if you're escaping from an abusive uh, partner, uh, you don't technically want uh, them showing up on the doorstep. So, thanks for bringing that up. That is a way that Christians can serve, serve and share the burden of a community. So, we've been going through the book of Acts, and today we're in Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 36. And I think what I'll do is I'll read the text, and then I'll come back to it uh, and talk a little bit through it. In Acts chapter 9, verse 36, it says, Now in Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which translated in Greek is called Dor Dorcas. This woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. And it came about at that time that she fell sick and died. And when they had washed her body, they laid it in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him, entreating him, do not delay to come to us. And Peter arose and went with them. And when he had come, they brought him into the upper room. And all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing all the tunics and garments that Dorcas used to make while she was with them. But Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up and called the saints and widows. He presented her alive. And it became known all over Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass about that he stayed many days in Joppa with a certain man named Simon, a tanner. There's a lot packed in this little story, and, and there's a few questions that I keep asking in many of the sermons that you've heard over the last few months, and that is, how did the church get here, and what did it look like? We're at this point in Acts in which Peter had just, our last sermon, he had, he had uh, gone to a town in Lydda and he had found this guy named uh, Aeneas and he was crippled for eight years and he laid his hands on Aeneas and he uh, saw God work a, a marvelous miracle to which Aeneas was restored to complete health. And we see that, uh, that this drew a lot of attention. The Bible tells us that it drew the whole town. It, it took everybody to Jesus. Everybody was impacted. 
It was a miracle nobody could deny. It was something that created a shift. We've also learned that the book of Acts has got an order to it, that there's kind of a grand outline to this book we've been studying, and it's the record of what the church looked like after Jesus rose from the dead, and it's a record of how they carried out his resurrection command, which was to go and preach the gospel to all creation. But more explicitly, it was to preach the gospel first in Jerusalem and Judea to the Samaritans and then to the ends of the world. And so this is the cutting point. This is the shift. This is where it changes. Everything is going to shift from this point on at this story with this girl named Tabitha. After this, we're going to learn all about the ministry to the Gentiles over and over and over and over again. We've learned about how the ministry went with the uh, Jews in Jerusalem, how there was a lot of persecution. We, we learned about the church and how it tried to take care of the needs of one another, how they, they, uh, uh, they prayed over men to become servants, to become deacons so that they could serve the widows in the church and they could really uh, wait the tables and do some of the physical work to actually help people. Kind of like first step, it would be a very similar kind of thing. And to get involved in the lives enough to, to meet people's practical needs. That it wasn't just a belief, it just wasn't an attendance to a new assembly, it wasn't just hearing a sermon, it wasn't just understanding the Bible, it wasn't just praying. It had to do with fellowship with one another and serving one another and helping one another with the practical needs of life. And we saw that one of the deacons, Stephen, was the first to be martyred in the early church. He gets stoned because he's not only a great servant, but he's also a great preacher of the gospel. And he preaches so well that it antagonizes the religious people that aren't coming to Christ. They're actually irritated at his message. His fellow Jews, maybe people that he knew from the past, maybe people that he grew up with, those that did not convert, those that did not accept Jesus as the Messiah, got more and more angry until eventually they stoned him to death. And the Bible hints that this was done with kind of this man that stood by. His name was Saul at the time. And he was standing there taking their garments, kind of approving of the situation. And he becomes the chief persecutor of the church. We see as the persecution of the church increased that Philip, another one of those deacons, he went off to Samaria, which was kind of like the half Jews or kind of like Jews that didn't have the complete message. And he preached the message there and miracles were performed and the whole town gathered around him and people were converted and they were baptized into the name of Jesus, yet they hadn't received the Holy Spirit. And so we see Peter and John being called to lay hands on them and the Holy Spirit falls on the Samaritans too, and it's phenomenal. It's, it's a unification of two branches of Judaism that had split so long ago. And we've learned a little bit about Hellenism and the preaching of, uh, uh, of the Jews that are kind of home in Jerusalem versus the Jews that are converted to Judaism out in the Greek and the Roman world. And sometimes they're full Jews. They just got displaced. They grew up in a worldly system and they became what is called Hellenistic Jews. Hellenistic is just a Greek word that means they're influenced by the Greek. Like today, we might call you a worldly Christian or a worldly uh, religious person. Matter of fact, if you go live in some of the other countries of the world, they might even label you an American Christian. And that's derogatory, by the way. Wow. It's not a compliment. Okay. Kind of tells you about the times. So we see a lot of these stories are shifting our mindset to the fact that, that the gospel, the message is not just going to the Jews, but it's going to these Hellenized Jews. And this is the culmination. So this is the last passage. And I want to bring out some things that are interesting about this. He says that Peter had been where he was with Aeneas. And I, last Sunday I said that Aeneas is, is a Greek name for a half-god. That this guy doesn't even have a Jewish name, or at least we're not given it. And the unique thing about Aeneas is that he has a relationship with this woman in, in Greek mythology, and her name is Dido. 
okay? And Dido loves him and cherishes him, but Aeneas in Greek mythology leaves Dido to go off to fight for Rome, and in the process, she's so grieved at, at his departure that she takes her own life. Okay, it's part of this Greek mythology thing. And so Dido is depicted in the Greek arts with, uh, in, in, in different ways, but, but with Aeneas leaving and then her taking her life as a gazelle. Well, that's interesting. And you'll see why that's interesting in a minute. So here in verse 36, it says, Now in Joppa there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which translated in Greek is called Dorcas. See, Luke wrote Acts in Greek for a Greek audience. And so he says, this girl's name was Tabitha, which by the way in Greek is Dorcas. Well, that didn't help us at all. Because we're not Greek and we're not Aramaic. We're not listening to... And, and so if Luke had been writing to us, he would have said, this girl's name was Tabitha, which translated in English is gazelle. Wow. Okay, which is interesting because Luke's playing around a little bit with this transition thing. He's not trying to subscribe to Greek mythology, but he is beginning to appeal to the idea that something is changing here in my writing. This is a deeper layer to Acts that you don't get to, to, to know unless you kind of carve a little time to study the original languages. I want to pause here to talk about names. All through biblical history, when God grabs a person, he often changes their name. When we think about Jacob, he wrestled with God and his name became Israel. Israel. When we think about Abram, he saw a great vision where God said, you're not just Abram, but you're going to be the father of many nations. Look at the stars of the sky. Look at the sands of the seashore. As many as you see, that shall be those that you father. And your name is no longer Abram. It is. And your wife, who was Sarai, is no longer Sarai. She is. Sarai. And so God does this over and over and over again in the Bible where he takes somebody's name and he says, I want you to have a new name. And in the case of Paul, it was Saul. In the pe case of Peter, it was Simon. Okay, so it's over and over. And, and in the early church, they used to do this. They used to to, to some, I don't mean the earliest meaning Acts necessarily, but it was a tradition in, in much of the early church that when you got baptized, they gave you a new name. Why would they do that? Because you're a new person. It's the only religion, it's the only faith in which we teach and understand that when you go down into the waters of baptize, baptism, something dies. And something new is born. And so they would do it as just a reminder. It wasn't a rule. It's not a doctrine. It's nothing you have to worry about. It's not a weight. It's just the idea they were trying to impress in your mind that that which you left behind is dead in the waters of baptism with Christ and that which you live ahead in your life is alive with Christ, secured in the heavenly realm. And so sometimes they gave people a new name. Now, this wasn't necessarily the story of a new name. Basically, all Luke here in this story is saying, hey, her name in Aramaic is Tabitha. For you Greek audience people, that's the same as gazelle. Okay? And so gazelle is a name, you know, when, when I said, dude, did you see that girl that was sitting on the corner chair there? She was a fox. What am I saying? She's attractive. She's attractive. When you hear Her uh, Jesus say, you know, Herod is a fox. Okay. So sometimes we apply animal names to people. When you apply people or human characteristics to, to inanimate objects, what do we call that? Anthropology. 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 Not quite. Anthropology. Anthropomorphism. Anthropos is the Greek word for man, and morphism is 
is the word for making something morph, okay, right? So when we do the opposite of that, it's like zo zoomorphism. Zoomorphism, where we take the attributes of an animal and we apply them to people. And we do that all the time. There's many examples. The Holy Spirit fell on Jesus as a? Okay. And so the, the, we do these things. Uh, I shall shatter you under the? Wings, you know, the, the psalmist says. And so it's not a crime. It is dangerous. It's a little dangerous if you start to worship in this way. You know, the, the first commandment says what? Don't, don't make me into the image of anything. God's pretty clear about not wanting to be idolized into the image of something of men. But we do it. We do it with names. We look at our kids sometimes and we, oh, you cute little shabby bear. You know, we might, might do stuff like that with the babies and stuff. And so this particular girl is called Tabitha in Aramaic. In Hebrew, it's Zibia. Okay? And she does occur in the Old Testament. But it means gazelle. And what are we thinking when we think of a gazelle or a, a, a deer? Great <coughs> Graceful. Fast. What'd you say? Maybe older when they're fast. What about when they're little tiny things? What do we call a tiny deer? A fawn. A fawn. What's the characteristic of a fawn? Fox. Clumsy. Okay, it's clumsy. It could hardly walk. Precious. It's precious. It's cute. How big are those eyes? Very big. Oh, man, they're big. Have you ever held a baby and just looked at their eyes and got, wow, look at those eyes. They just suck you right in. You're like, wow, you know. And I can, I don't know how Tabitha got her name, but maybe her mom was holding her and just looked at her and said, wow, what a gazelle. What a fawn. What a beauty. How precious she is. Okay. And so here's this Tabitha, and, and, and she's not only beautiful, she uh, grows up to be, the Bible says, abounding with good works, literally, and charity or alms. A lot of times the Bible tries to avoid translating things that say good works as good works because in Romans Paul's going to spend a lot of time talking about how you're saved by grace and not by works. But in this particular verse, if we were to strip it from all its translational issues that translators wrestle with, they, they try to make it so you won't feel like there's contradictions in the Bible. They're not, but it's very clear here that this woman performs a lot of good works. When you strip all the language uh, it, 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 traps away, it's telling you that she is one hard worker in the church. Amen. And that she gives a lot. She just totally gives a lot. It doesn't necessarily mean money. In this case, we find later in the story she gives a lot because she's a seamstress. She's making coats and tunics and blankets and she's doing stuff to serve the church. When she dies, they, a, a bunch of widows gather around and everybody's like showing off like, look what she made for me. Look what she did for me. And all these memories are flooding in. And, and, and the church, the community has been impacted by this woman's service. Did you all know that it's, it's Appreciate Women Month this month? I mean, this is it. This is Women's History Month right here. You know, there's a month for that. It, does it come every year? Or is it every two years? I mean, I feels like, it feels like we have a month for everything now, right? I mean, and so I don't know if there's 12... There's only 12 months of the year, so I'm a little bit like, you know, how do we do this thing? But it is a month in which at least some of the world is giving a little bit more attention to women and what women have done. And this is one of those stories where we're looking and Luke is pausing to let you know that this woman was amazing. And... So the Bible is flipped back to Peter again. We pause from Paul and we flip back to Peter again. And, and they, they find Peter. She's dead. And he's in a town that's nine miles away. They hear about it because of the great miracle that happened with Aeneas. And they go find Peter. And they're like, dude, you got to come join us at the church in Joppa. I'm already a flabbergasted that there's a church already in Joppa. Like, how did it get there? And what does it look like? We know that Philip 
went up through that trail uh, after he had miraculously been resurrected or, or transported after baptizing the eunuch. He, he's transported. It says he went to Azotus. And when we follow the old re ancient Roman road all the way to Caesarea, because we're going to see that Philip's going to get mentioned in a few chapters from now uh, about his prophetic daughters. And so we know that that's on the road. So we, we assume maybe that Philip was the guy that, that helped structure the church in Joppa. Well, what does that mean? What does is, what is structuring a church look like? Like this church has no pastor, this church has no deacon, this church has no apostle, this church has no titles. This is just a community of believers that are loving each other, taking care of each other, looking after each other's needs. All that we can gather is that there are people that are gathered together in the name of Christ and they're serving one another. They're concerned for one another. They're involved in each other's lives. It's not a ritual. How do they live out their Christianity? Do they argue about who's going to hand out the bulletins in the morning? Do they argue about who's going to lead worship or play the drums that day? Do they argue about who's going to be the elder? Do they argue about who's going to be the deacon? How do they live out their Christianity? We've replaced so much of Christianity with structure that we lost the heart of what Christianity is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. That's the heart of Christianity. And they're doing it. I don't know why. Why did they go to get Peter? Some people might jump the gun and say, well, they, 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 they thought he could raise her from the dead. Well, guess what? No apostle, no buddy has risen anybody from the dead since Jesus did it. So that's not an attribute of the early church. They're not thinking that way. Some people think every church should have a bunch of miracles. Well, none of these churches we visited had miracles. They're all calling on somebody else to come, and then they see miracles. That's interesting. Why? Why? Why is it that way? And why did Luke leave it for us to understand this way? That, that, that the Holy Spirit didn't fall on Samaria to, until Peter showed up. That, that, that uh, the Samaritans didn't experience the deliverance from demons until Philip showed up. That uh, the people that surrounded Stephen didn't experience the, the, the healings until Stephen showed up. Why? Why is the focus pointed on these guys? And, and then on the other hand, these guys are very, 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 very careful to always say that I did not heal you. I did not cast that demon out of you. I did not do the work. It's Christ. And that's interesting. The, the glory is never given to a man. And at this point, that miraculous power is not resident in any of the early churches. It comes to them, but it's not resident there. So what did the early church look like? What did the early church in Joppa look like? It looked like a community of believers that loved each other and loved the Lord their God and believed that Jesus was the Christ. And they really loved this woman named Tabitha. And she died. And they say, wow, I heard that Peter was down there at, at Lydda. And did you hear about that great miracle where, 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 where Aeneas uh, stopped being crippled after eight years and now he's, he's walking and he's healthy? Man, do you think Peter would come visit us? Let's go get him. And they make the trek down there and they get Peter. What did they expect? Maybe they just expected he'd come and comfort them. I don't know. Here's another thought. Well, what if you were Tabitha? And the Bible says she was a disciple. Verse 36. And it says that she did a lot. She abounded in good deeds and alms. She was on target. She was living the life right. And the Bible says she was a disciple. And I'll just say one little note about that. It's the only place in the word, you know, it, it, the Bible in this case was, in this book is written in Greek. It's the feminine form of the word disciple. It's the only place it ever occurs in the Bible. She's the only one that's ever called a female disciple. Every other female is grouped with the men. And I'm not saying there weren't other female disciples. All I'm saying is this particular verse highlights the fact that she's a female disciple. 
I don't question her salvation at all is what I'm getting down to. She is saved material. She dies, guess where she gets to be? <laughs> to die is to be present with the Lord. Yeah. That's what the scriptures say. And so he di she dies and is present with the Lord. Do you think she wants you to resurrect her? <laughs> I tell you what, I don't want to be resurrected if I'm in, in his presence. That's got to be an amazing moment. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Maybe they were celebrating. <laughs> they could have been celebrating, but they come down, and in the end, they're showing off all the great things that she's done, the mementos. Mm -hmm. And then Peter kicks him out. Everybody out of the room. <laughs> he hits his knees, and he prays, and then he looks at the body, and under the power of the Holy Spirit, he speaks to a dead corpse, and he says, Tabitha, arise! And boom, those gazelle eyes open again. And he looks at those eyes, and she looks at his, and she sits up. He says, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> and he reaches out his hand and lifts her up. Now I want to comment on that. That are you kidding me? Because that's that's kind of what I was saying. Like I I might want to be a little angry if you took me out of the presence of the Lord. But if you're a disciple, if your life's focus is Christ, is if He's who you serve, that every time you make a tunic, it's not for Hildegard down the road. It's it's for Jesus. Yeah. Every time you seam a little strap, it's for Jesus, and everything you do is for Jesus, and and you live your life for Him. Every meal you cook, every person you serve, every person you pick up, every person's feet that you wash, every little baby's hair that you comb, every bit of work you do, every yard you mow, every floor you sweep, every anguish you put into this life, and you're not doing it for the people so much as you're doing it for Christ himself, and then you're in the presence of the Lord, and you're excited, and then you're back on earth again. If your whole life is spent serving the master, and the master wants you to come back, yes. you're going to go back. If that's what the master wants, I want to please my master. Would it have been better to stay with him? You bet. I think it would be better. But it's never been about her. If she's a real disciple, it's not about her. So many people come to Christianity because it's about them. They actually come to Christianity because they think their life will be better now. And so when life gets tricky and it gets troubles and persecution comes and there's a price to pay now, then they leave Christianity. They fall away. They, they cease to be Christians because being a Christian is too hard. Or they find another group of people that call themselves Christians that won't call them to that standard of living and they'll find a place that'll give them the title but not the life. Yeah. But that's not the real Christian. And that's certainly not Tabitha. So she comes back from the dead. I, I was thinking about the mementos, the clothing. And I'm not saying that they did this, but, you know, how often it is that, that someone dies and then we honor them with, with all our praises and or, or, or we reflect on something they did or we, we have some token or we save this little teddy bear because that came from so-and-so and they died or we save something to remember to remind us of them, and we adore them, and, and we have all this gratitude in our hearts, and yet, while they lived, we didn't show the same adoration. We didn't show the same affection. We didn't let them know the impact that they were having on our life. We didn't talk to them about it. You know, the, the Christian life, in this case, it's a testimony written by the gratitude we see of this church. W what I'm saying is that everybody, we know the life of Tabitha by the gratitude of the church around her. When she died, they, they felt it. When she was missing, they, they felt it. How would it feel to be part of a fellowship that when you left, nobody even cared? 
What kind of fellowship is it that you could leave and nobody cares? None at all. What kind of church is it that we've structured in which you can attend and nobody knows your name? What kind of Christianity is that that we replaced handing out a bulletin with service to the true God? And sure, somebody needs to hand out the bulletin. And I'm really grateful, Scott, that you handed out the bulletins today and brought forth all your St. Patrick's Day jokes. I love them. <laughs> Scott's got a great idea, and I think it's a good one. That at 317 today, because it's March 17th, right? That all the lights in Harrisonburg should stay green for one minute. <laughs> Just in celebration of St. Patty, you know? Why not? I can't believe no legal or insurance representation. Yeah. Yeah. For legal reasons. <laughs> Be careful that you don't think what you do in this organized assembly is all you could do for God. A matter of fact, what you do here, it hardly probably compares to what you could do amongst each other every other day of the week. The Christianity that you live is much more vibrant and fruitful six of these seven days than it could be today. Yeah. Today we regroup, it's a huddle. How much is the huddle in the football game? It's a lot. You get some instruction, you get some pusher, you get pressure, but it doesn't win the game. This doesn't win the game. Yeah. <clears throat> it's what you do out there on the field that wins the game. That's where you're a Christian, not here. Amen. I'm glad you're in the huddle. <laughs> if you're not in the huddle at all, I'm wondering how you're playing the game. <laughs> I appreciate the huddle. I love the huddle. I'm here for the huddle. But this is not it. This is not the extent of your Christianity. What do you do in the other six days? And I don't want to spend it all huddling. I don't want to meet here every day and listen to a sermon every day. I want to live the life. I want to do the work. I want to visit, visit the sick and heal, heal the hurting. I want to speak life into the people that are dead. I want them to hear the gospel message. I want to serve. I want to love. I want to feel the joy. And I want to hurt with those who hurt. And I want to laugh with those who laugh. That's the game. Yeah. Tabitha was in the game. And that's why people were grateful for her. It wasn't like, hey, Peter, she's never missed a service in church. It was like, hey, Peter, look. Look at what she sowed for me. Look at what she did for me. Love while people are alive. It's interesting, they had a, a powerful widow's ministry. Philip had probably passed through there, and that was his original job, right? Look after the widows. Something probably tied in there. James, one day in his letter to the church, he says, True religion is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep yourself from being polluted by the world. True religion, James says, is to look after widows and orphans in their distress and to keep yourself from being polluted by the world. I'm not sure that they expected Peter to do a resurrection that day. But boy, it was amazing. It's the first time Peter ever resurrected anybody. It's the last time we heard he ever resurrected anybody. Jesus d does the resurrection. I'm not trying to give glory to Peter, but I just want you to take note that this is the only time he experienced that. You know, some people tend to kind of think that resurrections just pop up all over the church. This is the first resurrection in the church after eight years since Jesus rose from the dead. And the group of people that their tombs were overturned on that day. Remember, if you read carefully, when the temple veil rent, all the graves came up and many holy men were sitting in the city. So, so, so since that day, eight years later, here we are at the turning point of the church and there's a resurrection. The last time that Peter had anything to do with life and death, Ananias and Sapphira were dropping dead. He had the power of death with his words. And now we see 
him operating in the power of life with his words. We're only going to hear about one more resurrection in the entire Bible. Eutychus? Eutychus. Can Jesus raise the dead? Yeah, he can. And you know what? We're all waiting for one big giant one. We're waiting for a big giant resurrection of the dead. Jesus is coming back. And it says at that moment when he comes with the angels behind him, tens and thousands of angels in all his splendor and glory and the dead in Christ shall rise first and if there are some Christians alive the Bible says they shall be caught up together with him in the air Ooh, and then the judgment and then the judgment it's going to be amazing but we're waiting for a great resurrection I'll leave you with a couple more thoughts one is hey Peter, he didn't make a real show of this resurrection. Yeah. Somebody brought up in Sunday school about TV evangelists. And, you know, on the one side, you know, if you're stuck in bed somewhere, it's great to have somebody preaching the gospel to you. If none of your Christ Christian church members will come visit you, I mean, might as well have a TV do it. But here's Peter, he kicks everybody out. And there's a lot of thought about why, you know, some people think, well, he, he needed some time to pray focused alone. He hits his knees, he prays, he focuses alone, Lord, is this what you want? The Lord says, yes, this is what I want. And then he commands, Tabitha, arise, and she raises from the dead. No glory. Matter of fact, we don't see that the town is rushing to worship Peter. What we find is that those that knew her are, it's getting known all over Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. It doesn't say many believed in Peter at that point. It doesn't say after this that Peter started a great revival and everywhere he went, people followed him. <coughs> Why am I saying that? Because that's how we, send, we seem to gravitate today. We, we, we tend to put all the attention on the human and not enough tension on the God and you know what after this after chapter 10 with Cornelius Peter's going to get very 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 little attention for the rest of the Bible he's going to write two letters and he's going to get mentioned in a council and he's going to get mentioned how Paul rebuked him in, in a meeting where Peter seems to have reverted to just associating with those who are of a certain class of Christian rather than with everybody. Because it's not about Peter. It's never been about Peter. It's never been about Paul. It's never been about David. It's never been about Abraham. It's never been about any of these heroes that we have. It's always been about God and His love for us. And every once in a while, He borrows somebody and their life and their dedication to try to show it to you on your terms. He uses somebody in some special way to try to come down to earth for you and help you understand his love for you. But they're just tools. You can love them. You can cherish them. You, you, you can be grateful for them. But don't worship your saints. Yeah. Don't worship your heroes. Worship the one who loved you first. Mm -hmm. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for examples of great women in the Bible, like Tabitha. Thank you, Father, that her story lives on and that uh, she shows us how to be a Christian. She shows us that being a Christian, being a disciple, was, was uh, loving you with all her heart. She shows us that it was serving the disciples 
around her or the community, maybe even non-disciples. She served God. She, she used her hands and she sewed and she did things to provide for people. And Father, it also tells us that she was very giving, that she was sacrificial. Lord, I, I wonder how many garments she sold and how many she gave away or how many that she didn't sell for the price they should have been sold for. She had a great impact on the society around her, Father, that, that when she was dead and gone, so many people found in their heart the gratitude for her life. Father, it shows us that the life of a disciple is one in which makes other people grateful. God, help us to live a life in which others would look at us and say, you know, I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for the way you serve. I'm grateful for the way you love. I'm grateful for the way you give. God, help us not to put the service of you into one day a week and realize that living out Christianity is much more than the huddle. It's the game. It's what we do the rest of the week. It's how we treat one another and love one another. Father, help us to operate in this age, in this time where the church has grown to be the structure it is, but at the same time, help us not to neglect the heartbeat of the early church. The fervor, the miracles, the desperation, the prayer, the faith that had the ability to see miracles happen. Lord, there's miracles every day around us that we neglect to acknowledge you for. We just don't see them. We're buried in our own lives, in our own pain, in our own distraction, in our own excuses. And so I pray, God, that you'd open our eyes like a gazelle, that we would have our eyes wide open for you, our Father, like little children in your arms, that we would look up into your eyes, Father, and, and just connect that little subtle smile, that time before understanding, that time before we could think, speak, act, or do anything. And yet the glow in the eyes tells us there's meaning, there's understanding, there's connection, there's love. Help us to get there, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.